Hello, Marcus Bronzy here from Trek Culture. Now, when Star Trek premiered, Mr. Spock was just the logical guy with pointed ears and green blood. But the opportunity to give this strange visitor from another planet powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, despite him not being from Krypton, clearly proved irresistible. So over the course of his screen history, various episodes endowed Spock with an array of power-ups, some logical, some utterly illogical. In moderation, this emphasised his alienness, but the cumulative effect over three seasons turned him into a Swiss army knife. Don't believe it? Try these out. I'm Marcus Bronzy from Trek Culture, and here is nine times Mr. Spock got a power up! Number 9. Spock's Super Strength When he first appeared, Mr. Spock did not possess superhuman abilities, so when his uncanny strength was written into a fight scene in the first season, A Taste of Armageddon, the show's research firm, The Forest Research, noted that, quote, really extraordinary strength has never before been attributed to Mr. Spock. The scene was rewritten and super strength was dropped. In that same season, however, the script for This Side of Paradise indicated that Spock is stronger than most men. Sensing a pattern, DeForest Research asked again, in the previous script, Mr. Spock's ability has been emphasised. This and an early version of A Taste of Armageddon are the first references to this extraordinary strength, which has never been dramatised. Is this meant to establish a new characteristic for Spock? This time, the strength attribute stuck. In the aired episode, Kirk notes in his log that Mr. Spock is much stronger than the ordinary human being. Aroused, his great physical strength could kill. <laughs> That's what she said. This is demonstrated when Spock literally punches his fingers through a new, there just to be punched, then never seen again, side piece on the transporter console, followed by a missed punch which damages a food synthesizer on the wall, ensuring no further tomorrow is yesterday chicken soup gags would occur in this room. Then, in the season 2 opener, A Mock Time, Spock is shown to be so strong he can pulverize a computer monitor with his fist. Power up? I think so. Number 8. Spock's Vulcan Mind Meld Perhaps the most famous power-up of all, the Vulcan Mind Meld was a last-minute addition to the first season episode, Dagger of the Mind. The original plan was for Spock to perform hypnosis on Dr. Simon Van Gelder. Here's what the final draft describes. His back partly turned as he painfully charges up his resources of psychic energy for the ordeal he's about to undergo. He fixes a pinpoint light on Van Gelder's eyes and switches on a device emitting a soothing sound. He now places a strange pair of hypnogenic goggles, or any other acceptable hypnotic aid, over Van Gelder's eyes. This reads halfway between hypnosis and some telepathy. Then Roddenberry changed his mind and gave Spock a mind-reading power-up instead. Thank Rod for that. Rod? Yeah, instead of... Right, anyway. But just as Play It Again Sam was never uttered in Casablanca and Kirk never said beam me up Scotty, neither did Spock even once utter the term mind meld in the original series. In fact, the mind meld doesn't get any sort of name in this at all for the first season, where it's used four times. Limited telepathic abilities are inherent in the Vulcanians and the Vulcan technique of the joining of two minds. This power up is employed a record six times in the third season, and it's Kirk who finally calls it a mind Mind meld in two episodes, whereas Spock calls it a mind fusion. Spock eventually caved though. 13 years after first using the technique, he finally uttered the now ubiquitous term in Star Trek The Motion Picture when he said, I must try to mind meld with it. After that, it was mind meld, mind meld, mind meld, baby. Number 7. Spock's Optic Nerve and or Inner Eyelid This one's a two for one deal. After Spock is blinded by intense light in Operation Annihilate, the script bequeaths him with an optic power-up that hits that reset button so everything goes back to normal just in time for the end of the season. Ha! <laughs> Timing, eh? Basically, McCoy says his blindness is temporary because there's something special about his optic nerves which aren't the same as humans. Spock then says it's a hereditary trait because the brightness of the Vulcan sun causes a development in their inner eyelid which acts as a shield against high-intensity light and it's totally instinctive, kind of ignored by Vulcans, just like we ignore our appendixes. So, which is it, Spock's optic nerve or an inner eyelid? The two are wholly different anatomical features, yet the two men act as if they're discussing the same thing. Either way, it's a power-up, two-for-one deal. Not to mention that Bones seriously needs to bone up on Vulcan anatomy.
Number six, Spock's hypnotic personality. For months before the series premiered, on May 2nd, a 1966 memo from Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry included this about Mr. Spock. Hypnotism is an everyday tool on Spock's home planet, deriving from the intellectual intensity of the culture there. It forms a part of their economic, social and sex life. But he uses this ability rarely since it is one of the many compromises Spock has had to make in the past in order to rise to his present position and live with humans. This was planned to be shown in Dagger of the Mind but dropped in favour of the mind meld and forgotten. Or was it? In the second season's The Omega Glory, while Kirk and Captain Tracy are fighting to the death, Spock locks eyes with the young woman Syrah and she looks as if she's in a trance. When McCoy asks what she's doing, Spock says, I'm making a suggestion. He wordlessly gets her to activate one of their confiscated communicators, bringing the Sulu cavalry to the rescue. Suggestion evokes a post-hypnotic suggestion and it sure looks like some sort of hypnosis. So a hypnosis power-up, it is. Number 5. Spock's computer connection Bones has been known to mention Spock's mathematically perfect brainwaves and even implied he was machine-like when he said, well, I don't know why I was worried, you can't kill a computer. But the good doctor apparently had no idea the accuracy of his diagnosis because by the end of the second season, Spock could mind meld with a multiple number of species. Plus, his telepathic power-up got power-upped to allow him to join minds with machines. This inexplicable ability appears in The Changeling when Spock says, Captain, I suggest the Vulcan mind probe and proceeds to do a mental download from the Nomad space probe's memory banks. Spock tries the same gimmick in I Mud. After Norman the android stops responding, Spock places his hand on Norman's head in the characteristic mind meld fashion and reports he simply appears to have turned himself off Captain. But that wasn't it for Spock getting mental broadband. In Star Trek The Motion Picture, he nearly gets his brain fried trying to plug into Vija's Universal Wide Web. To be fair, in retrospect, such nonsense makes mind melding with whales seem perfectly logical. Number 4. Spock's Warp Speed Telepathic Receiver Now, we usually see Spock either touching his mind, fusion, probe, mind meld subject, or maybe it's just a few inches away with at most a wall between them. Well, except in the immunity syndrome when Spock jolts and reports, Captain, the intrepid, it just died and the 400 Vulcans aboard, all dead. Mind you, the Intrepid is reported to be in solar system Gamma 7, which a full long range scan indicates is dead. As Douglas Adams observed, space is big, really, really big. And even if the Enterprise were right outside the system, spoiler, it's not, normal radio waves, let alone brain waves at light speed would take hours or days to reach the ship. If they were one star away, years, so for Spock to feel 400 minds die at such a range requires Vulcan mental emanations to travel at FTL faster than light velocity. So just what sort of psychic horsepower do Vulcan brains put out to be detectable at such ludicrous distances? And just what sort of receiver is Spock's brain packing in it to receive this kind of transmission? I wasn't the only one bamboozled. It even had Dr. McCoy asking, I thought you had to be in physical contact before you could do a mind meld. Spock's reply, he's half Vulcan and he could hear the death scream of 400 Vulcan minds crying out over the distance because he can. That's why, just because. Fortunately, this silly faster than light telepathic power up was a one and done. Well, we've actually also seen it most recently when Sarek melds with Burnham across space in Discovery. So a few times and done, right? Number three, the FSNP. Originally, the script for The Enemy Within called for Spock to subdue the duplicate Kirk via rather violent means, by basically knocking him out. But actor Leonard Nimoy protested that such a violent action was out of character for Spock. Reportedly, he huddled with William Shatner and they improvised a bit of business wherein Nimoy grabbed Shatner's shoulder in an odd way and Shatner rolled his eyes and collapsed. The director went for it and the FSMP, aka the famous Spock neck pinch, was born. But this bit of improv was not initially met with cheers because just three weeks earlier, a memo from Trek creator Gene Roddenberry to all concerned had cautioned against such action on set. It basically said, if you want to change the script, don't. So Nemo got scolded, but guess what? Spock got powered up. Number two, Spock's super hearing. 
Spock's Iconic ears also fell victim to being powered up. So in addition to them being pointy shaped, their shape was given a point. <laughs> Spock could hear better than normal humans. McCoy in the first season's The Galileo 7 asks, what do those super sensitive ears make of that Mr. Spock? And this power up is also mentioned at the end of the season's Operation Annihilate, when Spock overhears a compliment by McCoy from across the bridge, where Kirk says you've been so concerned about his Vulcan eyes, Doctor, you forgot about his Vulcan ears. In the second season's Return to Tomorrow, the life force of the evil henpeck occupying Spock's body brags about it having superior strength, hearing and eyesight. Two back-to-back -back season three episodes touch up on this oral power-up as well. Is there no end to his power up -edness? Well, obviously not, because there's one more. Number one, Spock, the illogical snowman. When thrown into the Ice Age past of the planet Sarpedon in all of our yesterdays, it is Spock who is better able to withstand the cold than McCoy, who suffers frostbite and nearly dies. This oddity did not slip past the fact checker at DeForest Research whose report dated December 9th, 1968 contained information saying that humans can't regulate their metabolism at will and Spock can't either when it comes to being cold. Spock, in fact, is meant to have superheated quarters that help him stay comfortable because he's used to a warmer climate. Cold should affect him faster than any discomfort, even physical injury. They advise that they delete this because it's inconsistent with Star Trek lore. A couple of years earlier, Gene Roddenberry wrote this about his home planet. Since the home planet is also drier and hotter than Earth, Spock can withstand greater temperatures and go longer without water. So in my books, greater temperatures doesn't mean lesser temperatures. If anything, it should have been Spock shivering in his little space boots instead of bones. But no, in the penultimate series episode, Spock gained an antifreeze power up. If you think we missed anything, let us know in the comments below. For more awesome Star Trek content, make sure you hit like and subscribe on Trek Culture. And don't forget to give us a follow on the old Twitter too, at Trek Culture. You can find me on all social medias at Marcus Bronzy, M-A-R-C-U-S-B-R-O-N-Z-Y. Until next time.